Hello and welcome to part 11 of this epic walkthrough of L, a mathematical adventure for the BBC Micro. In the previous part of the walkthrough we had reached at the bat puzzle and we'd solved the bat puzzle and we're very happy with the bat puzzle and now we are going to get access to a new room as a result. So we're going to go south from the bat room Anyway, uh, the, uh, we've gone south. You're in a room painted a dark shade of blue. Silver stars cover the high ceiling like the night sky. The only door leads north. An old bus ticket is lying on the ground. It seems to have something written on it. Why anyone would drop a bus ticket in this godforsaken place, I've no idea. But uh, we're going to get it anyway because it's there. And we're sort of thieving magpie type creatures. And we'll read the ticket and see what was written on it. And you can actually do that for once. On the back of the bus ticket is written in spidery handwriting, the combination is a perfect square and a perfect cube. Now, the combination to what, we don't yet know. But it will inevitably be explained. So, for, for the time being, we simply make a note of that, a mental note, and carry on. So, where do we go next? We go back north to the bat room. Uh, the large bat is now ignoring us, which is nice because we don't need to keep on giving it triangular numbers as if it had some kind of uh, addiction to them. Uh, we're back in the circular room. We're going northwest again. And we're in a room which has been left half decorated. The walls are painted half black and half white. Doors lead to the southeast, west, and north. So we're going, in this case, to go west. You're, you've passed through a large door which covers the whole of one side of a wall. You're standing in a corridor with several other people. As the corridor slowly closes, as the door slowly closes behind you, the corridor grows longer and longer, and more and more people appear. There seem to be doors to the east and west. So what we can do here is we can try to go west. As you move, everyone else in the corridor moves too. Before you're halfway to the west door, you bump into a cold, flat surface which is impossible to pass. Uh, what does that mean then? What on earth does that mean? Can we go back east? As you open the door to leave, the long corridor and all the people vanish. We're in the half-decorated room again. So basically, the room we were just in with a load of people and a door we can't get to um, is a mirror room. And it's covered in mirrors, and that's why there seem to be loads of people, because it's kind of like a hall of mirrors, so there must be mirrors at different angles to give that effect, um, or possibly simply uh, that receding infinite reflections effect. And that's what that is. Um, and there's very little point to that, except I suppose you're supposed to work out what's going on. And it's a mirror. That's what's going on. Now, we exit again to the half-decorated room, and we see that it's possible to go north from here. You're in a cramped space like a chimney. A metal ladder disappears up into the darkness. A wooden door leads south. So basically, you can either go back out or you can go up. And going up, in fact, takes you to the attic passage that leads to the pig room and the Drogo jail. And I wonder if that's why the attic passage smelt a bit fishy. Because there was an exit down? I don't know. Um, anyway, it'll take you back up there, and uh, that's not a good idea because you have to escape... Uh, using uh, Newman and then travel back to here. Uh, I suppose that's the whole point of the Crowther Woods teleportation words, actually, to make your return to the circular room rapid. Well, hey ho. Um, that's as maybe. But I won't go back up there because we've seen all that bit of the game before um, the pigsty, the jail area. So I shall simply return the way I came and go back through the half-decorated room 
back to the circular room which is a junction point with uh, exits in all directions. Uh, there is one more place we can go and that's south actually there are a couple more places we can go. Um, we can go southwest. You're in a room with a microcomputer which rests on a large wooden bench. There's a door to the northeast. As you enter the room, a disappearing voice says, Listen, OK, I'm going to the toilet, OK. Don't touch my computer, OK. This game is OK. Uh, well, uh, that's for me to decide. Uh, you see nobody, but the microcomputer seems to be switched on. Do you want to see the screen? Well, of course. I mean, uh, why wouldn't we? Da da da. Everything's gone green. You're in a room with a microcomputer which rests on a large wooden bench. There's a door to the northeast. As you enter the room, a disappearing voice says, Listen, OK, I'm going to the toilet, OK. Don't touch my computer, OK. This game is OK. You see nobody, but the microcomputer seems to be switched on. Do you want to see the screen? If anybody remembers that noise, um, that means this is a very eerie uh, situation because we've got the same description, room description and text that we had before, but simply in a different colour. So I'm going to say yes to see the screen again. And this time we have a lovely cyan bit of text, um, which says exactly the same thing. You're in a room with the microcomputer, the disappearing voice, listen OK, I'm going to the toilet, don't touch the computer. You see nobody, but the microcomputer seems to be switched on. Do you want to see the screen? Let's say yes. And now we have a purple, pinkish colour of text. I'm trying to remember exactly what the name for that um, colour is. Oh, magenta, that's right. According to the uh, official Beeb manual, that's magenta. Um, and the text is exactly the same. You're in a computer room, uh, voice disappearing, presumably the voice of the computer operator or the... Um, Resident nerd, and he's telling you not to touch the computer. You see nobody, but it's switched on. Do you want to see the screen? Yes. I mean, why is this happening? So clearly, we're seeing screens within screens, computers within computers. And if you try to see the screen in the magenta room, the message on the screen reads, Out of memory at recursion level 3. Hmm. Oh dear, what are we to do? How do we escape from this situation? You're in a room with a microcomputer. I mean, you know, there's very little we can do. We can go out, I suppose, northeast, and we're back in the circular room, and we can uh, wander around in the circular room and see what we can see. You seem to be standing in a very long corridor. We've gone back to the mirror room. Let's get out of there. Um, so maybe the rest of the game is now purple. Um, and we simply have to be content with that and, and, and carry on. Oh, no, because lo and behold, suddenly the text changes to cyan and you recognize a voice behind you saying, ah, that's better. OK, get off my computer, OK. And you're back in the microcomputer room. So we've gone back up one level of recursion. And it's all very fascinating because it's worlds within worlds, wheels within wheels, and it's multiple levels of reality, and it's all very interesting. There is, in fact, another way to exit and go back up a level of recursion, um, and that is to say exit computer and it checks you out immediately and so you know this is the first level and we can exit again and ta-da we are back to white text the good old familiar white text which says you recognize a voice behind you saying ah that's better okay get off my computer okay you're back in the microcomputer room. And this is, in fact, the top level, the uh, level we were originally playing this whole game at. Um, we didn't disappear around, down a rabbit hole of uh, recursive levels of reality. Um, we managed to escape. And it does, of course, make you wonder, what would happen if you typed exit computer at the 
what purports to be and what you assumed was the top level of reality. What will happen if I do that? Well, let's just try it, shall we? And my god, what's going on? It's suddenly uh, everything's gone green and and it's source code. It's the source code of the game. It's as if I can see the very fabric of reality unraveling before me. It's 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 incredible. It's amazing. It's almost as if this entire thing has been constructed by some kind of all-powerful mystical architect. Who could it be? Who could it be? Who could it be? Well, we know, in fact, exactly who it is and who it could be. It's the Association of Teachers in Mathematics, because, in fact, none of that happens at all. Um, I was just pulling a leg and making things up and trying to be a little bit more entertaining than normal. Uh, it didn't work, did it? No, I apologise. I apologise for my miserable failure. Um, we didn't enter the Matrix. We, in fact... Or, or emerge from it, we in fact uh, didn't do anything at all. Because if you try to exit computer at this top level of reality, you're simply told that I don't understand. So that's a little bit disappointing. I think the Association of Teachers of Mathematics um, who wrote this game uh, missed a trick there. They could have been years ahead of their time. The Wachowski brothers could have been uh, very envious of them and might have had to pay them royalties and the association could have been all millionaires by now. Uh, but that didn't happen. None of that happened. None of that that I've just gone into for um, the, the past few minutes actually happened. So I do apologise for making this even longer than was necessary. Um, anyway, <laughs> that's all uh, digression and I apologise for it. So we return to the circular room, uh, returning to reality, returning to the walkthrough by Darren Izzard, brother of Eddie, and we're back in the circular room, and where is left, in fact, to go now? Um, what I'm going to do is actually follow the walkthrough. We could, at this stage, go south. There are two directions we haven't tried, northeast and south. South, in fact, I will show you, but if we were to go south right now, uh, something unfortunate would happen, so instead of that, uh, with um, uh, foreknowledge, uh, in fact, of, of events to come, I am going to wisely go north-east. And you have entered a room with a stone floor. In the north wall is the large door of a safe, with a numerical keypad fixed to it. There is a door to the southwest. The door of the safe is locked. Now, do you remember, do you remember the ticket that we had um, picked up uh, after solving the bat puzzle? Uh, there it is. On the back of the bus ticket is written in spidery handwriting. The combination is a perfect square and a perfect cube. Now, I wonder if it's the combination to the safe that we're after here. And I wonder if we need to find a number that's a perfect square and, in fact, a perfect cube. Well, there are several of these numbers. So what numbers will fit the bill here? Well, if you think about it, you realise that to find numbers that are perfect squares and perfect cubes, you need to cube a perfect square and that's how you find possible combinations if indeed that's what it's after so let's start out by trying zero because you know by some definition some people would say that's a perfect square and let's cube that and we still get zero the safe door remains closed. Let's try one, because the uh, same applies there. That could be said to be a perfect square, and if you cube that, you also get one. And the safe door remains closed, so that's not what we want either. Let's try 64, because that is the uh, square of 8 and the cube of 4. There's a buzzing sound from behind the safe door, but it remains securely closed. 
Aha, uh -huh. so it is, um, we're on the right track. So 